Okay, welcome everybody. This is the San Joaquin College of Law Law School 101 Informational Forum. We're so happy to have you joining us tonight virtually. Due to COVID-19 safety requirements, we're bringing our law forum to you online this evening. Uh, my name is Diane Steele and I'm the Director of Admissions. And I'm also joined tonight with uh, Francisco Rosas. He's our Assistant Director of Admissions and Student Engagement. Both of our phone numbers and our contact information are there on the screen. Feel free to contact us via email or phone call if you have any questions about the admissions process or San Joaquin College of Laws program, we're happy to assist you. If you're interested in starting law school this August for fall 2020, we're accepting applications through June 30th. So we welcome you to go ahead and apply if you um, are applying for fall 2020, you do need to have already taken the LSAT or you would need to um, be registered for the July LSAT. The July LSAT is the last test that you can sit for to enroll in law school for fall 2020. The next LSAT you'll see on our screen here is uh, scheduled for August 29th and the deadline to register is July 15th. And you can register for that event by going to the lsac.org website. So welcome everybody. We're super happy to have you here with us tonight. And um, we look forward to uh, sharing this presentation with you. San Joaquin College of Law was founded in 1969, and it is a tremendous resource, not only to our students so that they can become attorneys, it is a great resource to our community. We have, uh, as part of our institution, the New American Legal Clinic, and it is um, for short called NALC, and it's a wonderful uh, service that we provide to the community to help anyone who is interested in becoming a legal resident or a legal um, a citizen, they can uh, contact the New American Legal Clinic and they will help them for at no cost. So we're really proud of what the New American Legal Clinic is doing for our residents in our community and helping those um, who are undocumented to get the services they need. We also offer MCLE units and these are um, mini minimum continuing legal education units once you become an attorney, you're required to do some additional training and, and um, keep active on your knowledge and skills. And we offer those classes at our institution. So we're really proud of that. We also offer through our institution, the Senior Law Day, um, providing services and education and information for all of the seniors in our community that would like to join us. Many of our alums, uh, provide their services for that day. And we also have on campus our library that many people in our community uh, utilize. So um, know that we are an institution that not only serves our students to help them become um, lawyers and receive their Juris Doctor degree, but we also work hard to be engaged in and involved in our community and providing services for our community. The law school is not only an educational resource, but it's also an employment resource. If you think about the fact that there's approximately 32% of the attorneys in the Fresno area are San Joaquin College of Law alums, uh, imagine how many of those firms, each one of those firms, each one of those attorneys, how many people they also employ. So you could imagine that we are also a tremendous employment resource right here in the Valley. Approximately 33% of the attorneys in the Fresno area who identify with a minority group are also SJCL alumni. And approximately 38% of uh, the women attorneys in the Fresno area are SJCL alumni. So uh, we are a huge resource right here in the Valley our first graduating class was in 1974, and we moved to the current institution, the current uh, building that we're in now in 1995. Our building formerly was the old Clovis High School. 
And um, now we're super proud of the renovations that have occurred and how it's Wi-Fi um, all throughout. And we look forward to um, getting past this COVID-19 and having you all um, come meet us and see us in person in the law school. Oftentimes people question, why do it? Why should I get my law degree? Not only is it going to provide you just a tremendous amount of personal growth um, and career and employment development, um, you will uh, be sought after um, by not only your family members, but your, your uh, work site, because a law degree brings with it just a tremendous amount of knowledge that a small percentage of individuals actually hold. So you will be joining a community of people that bring value to any work site and uh, bring value and knowledge to your families, your loved ones, and your community. What's exciting about our location, you'll see there location, location, location. And if you look at the map and you see the star there on the um, uh, state of California, uh, you'll notice that we are the only law school in over a 120 mile radius. All those other red dots are other law schools, uh, other accredited law schools that are located in Southern California and Northern California. But by um, this map, you can see that we're the only game in town. And so what that means to you is that when you're a student, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunities available to you without all the competition. So in those law schools that you'll see clustered in Southern California or Northern California, you could imagine how many law school students they have in those schools all going after externships and clerkships. And you just aren't gonna have that degree of competition, uh, not only um, just when you're a student getting internships, but also once you graduate, the job opportunity and the career outlook is tremendous. So uh, we're really proud of that opportunity and that's something very, very unique to San Joaquin College of Law. The job availability and the career outlook and the earning potential that you'll have once you have your Juris Doctor degree is tremendous. There are just so many opportunities. You can be a um, immigration attorney, an inter entertainment attorney. You can, um, you can be an in-house counsel for a large corporation. You can be the uh, in-house counsel for a hospital. Several of our grads are in-house counsel for uh, St. Agnes as well as um, community medical centers. Uh, one of our grads um, has gone on to become the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state of California. So the sky's the limit. Once you obtain your Juris Doctor degree, you will find that you have so many different things that you can do. I um, have heard people say that um, it's a great degree to obtain because you don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up because you can uh, change your career and retool your skills in such a broad, broad scope of employment opportunities. So we're excited about that. And what's extremely unique is not only are you so employable by, by so many different already existing law firms, you also reserve the right to become self-employed. So you can hang your own shingle and start your own law firm. And that is really exciting. I mean, out of, if you think of all the different careers that you can choose, how many careers can you not only be employed by um, different government agencies or different firms or different organizations, but you can also become self-employed. And I, I think that's a huge benefit of, be, of getting your Juris Doctor degree. Law school education. People often say, well, what is law school like? Um, and I just wanna address that. Um, there's four different skills in law school and they're highlighted here on this slide. Substantive law, practical skills, a problem solving method of thought and ethical principles and standards of law. 
So substantive law and theoretical skills, this is one that is essential, is critical. This is what you're being tested on on the bar exam. So an example of this would be um, things like um, adverse possession or personal jurisdiction or all the different laws that you are going to become knowledgeable in throughout your three, four, or five years in law school. It's everything that you need to know and that you will be tested on in the bar exam. It's the most important component. Also important, though, are the practical skills that you're going to be gaining in law school. And these practical skills are um, things like trial practice and negotiation and oral advocacy. You're going to gain these skills through the curriculum that we offer on uh, Moot Court, which is a course that all of our students take. Uh, you'll be able to continue to develop those skills if you choose to take some elective classes like criminal trial practice if you want to train yourself to become a trial practice attorney. And there's also other wonderful um, courses that you'll be able to choose from as electives to help develop these more practical skills. Uh, a problem solving method of thought. This is very exciting. This is an area um, that you're going to be able to learn to, to think like a lawyer. Um, there is an acronym called IRAC and it is uh, issues, rules, analysis, and conclusion. And you are going to learn all of those things, how to apply that, how to really analyze things. I think what's really exciting about becoming a lawyer is you learn to synthesize things and think like an attorney um, much more differently than anybody else who's never gone through law school. So, um, when we do move to the uh, panel portion of this event tonight, be sure to ask our panelists in greater detail um, what that means to them, those problem-solving methods of thought, the IRAC principle. Be sure and ask them in greater detail about that. Um, also, the ethical principles and standards of law. This is something that you're going to have a whole course dedicated to um, called pro, um, responsibility, professional responsibility. This entire course is going to help prepare you for the ethical principles and standards of law. You, you want to know what to fall back on. You want to know what is expected of you as an attorney. You have a duty as an attorney to be ethical and to hold the highest standards of the law. For example, one of the the duties of our attorneys, our grads, is, is the duty to, duty to be zealous advocates for your clients. So these are all super exciting things that you're going to learn. Um, I had an example given to me by one of our grads who, um, when she was in the courtroom and she was really practicing one of the rules, which is to be extremely respectful. You have duty to be extremely respectful to opposing counsel. And she really attributed the fact that she won the case because she held herself to that high ethical standard of law by being respectful to opposing counsel. So just know that you are in a, a community of um, a group of people that are going to be held to a very high ethical principle and standards. And it's an exciting uh, new tools that you'll have uh, once you become an attorney. Next, people often are curious about the accreditation process and levels of accreditation. There are four uh, tiers of accreditation, and by all means, feel free to um, pose any questions in our Q&A, and we'd be happy to answer them as we move through this, um, this PowerPoint presentation. Um, usually, there's a lot of questions about accreditation, and so I welcome you to ask that while we're on this slide, because I want to help you remove any barriers or confusion about this. There's four tiers of accreditation. Um, the lowest tier is there are law schools that are unaccredited law schools, and uh, that's the bottom tier. The next step, there's law schools that are accredited by the Committee of Bar of Examiners. And this is an accreditation that San Joaquin College of Law uh, has. Uh, the a tier above that is where we are, though. We are not only um, a, 
accredited by the California Bar of Examiners, we're also accredited by WASC, which stands for Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Uh, the top tier is the ABA, American Bar Association, and this tier we do not have yet. It's something that we aspire to do. We hold ourselves to that standard when it comes to curriculum. Uh, we work hard to meet those standards when it comes to bar pass rate. In fact, we even exceed uh, some ABA schools in bar pass. So um, we, we are, let's see, Terrence, you have your hand raised. So um, at this point, if you can type your question in the Q&A, I'd be happy to answer your question if you don't mind uh, typing it at this point in the Q&A. Um, we'd be happy to answer it. Um, we, uh, we are currently, though, California Bar of Examiners and WASC accredited. We do have goals and aspirations to become ABA accredited, and uh, it is something that um, is going to require uh, expanding our library, doubling the size of our library, as well as uh, doubling uh, the size of our full-time faculty members. So um, it's something that I'm not sure, I, can't, I cannot predict exactly when we will become ABA, but it is something that we are definitely aspiring to become. I do want to point out to you though with this slide um, that whether you graduate from an ABA law school or what we are at California Bar Accredited Law School and Western Association of Schools and Co Colleges, you're gonna sit for the exact same bar exam and you're gonna get the exact same license to practice law in the state of California. So uh, what you will find though is attending a, an ABA law school is, is twice as expensive. So um, we are happy to answer more questions about that. Let's see, we had a question in our Q&A. Does accreditation affect licensing in other states? Is there a drawback to not being an ABA accredited? Thank you for those questions. So by graduating from a California Bar Accredited Law School or an ABA Accredited Law School, you're getting a license to practice law in the state of California. Even if you go to an ABA law school, you will not be able to um, practice law in, a, in another state until you sit for that state's bar exam. So that is something that an ABA school gives you that we cannot give you, is the privilege to sit for the bar exam in another state immediately after passing the California bar. But do note that after three to five years of practice in the state of California from our law school, San Joaquin College of Law, California Bar Accredited and WASC Accredited Law School, you will still have the opportunity after three to five years of practice to, to sit for another state's bar exam. Over half of the 50 states allow you to sit for their bar exam after three to five years of practice. So in answer to Daisy's question, is there a drawback to, be, to not being ABA accredited? Our graduates will often tell you they have not had any drawbacks. Some of our Warren Papugian, one of our superstars from our law school, whose most respected trial attorney will tell you there's never been a drawback for him in um, his career. Uh, you know, you really are building your own reputation. Perhaps the law school's reputation uh, may open up the door to your first job. Uh, if you were wanting to practice law in Southern California or Northern California, maybe it might make more sense for you to go to a law school in that area because that law school has a reputation in that area. Uh, but really, as you progress in your career, you are building your own reputation. And specifically, if you are interested in, in, in at least launching your career in the Central San Joaquin Valley, um, you are going to have the benefit of people who know our school, who graduated from our school, who want to hire uh, people from our school, because students from San Joaquin College of Law are less likely to use their first job as a springboard to another job. So many law firms here in the Central San Joaquin Valley feel as though um, you are more likely to um, stay with their firm longer, uh, being that you went to San Joaquin College of Law. So there are uh, benefits of going locally. 
I encourage you to think about where it is you want to launch your career. And really, that's where you're going to build those connections with people while you're a student all over um, about we have about 40 adjunct professors who are all practicing attorneys who teach for us. So you're going to begin building those relationships. You're going to begin building your practice of law while you're a student. Now, if it's your fantasy or desire to go practice law in Southern California and Northern California, I definitely also want to emphasize that this is also a good choice for you because you are going to have an opportunity to get more prominent positions more quickly in an area that is legally underserved, that there's more positions than there are graduates to fill them. So you're gonna get yourself into a more prominent position more quickly than in those competitive markets in Southern California and Northern California, where you have a half a dozen or more law schools all clustered together in one area. Will you get a solid education? Absolutely, more than 70% of San Joaquin College of Law graduates have passed the California bar exam. And uh, San Joaquin College of Law has the second highest bar pass rate of California bar accredited law schools. So I'm gonna show you uh, in a minute here, um, something that we actually pulled from the California bar um, website. So this is something that you can take a look at. It's not information that we wrote, it's guidelines for accredited law schools and rules that we pulled from their website. <clears throat> So you can see in 2018, we were first. We had over, um, we had 77.4%. So we were number one. And in 2019, we are second behind Cal Northern School of Law that is 73. So we're very, almost tied for first. Uh, but we're very, very proud of what we bring you and the level of, um, of education and bar pass uh, we're very proud of. Your success is our success. So we are committed to our bar pass rate, which means we are committed to, to you. The environment in um, law school is um, really, really collaborative. We hear over and over from our students um, just how collaborative the environment is here at San Joaquin College of Law. Our students are known to uh, help each other to succeed. We don't grade to a curve, we grade to a standard. So all of our students are able to advance to the second, third, and fourth year given that they meet certain standards of requirements. It's different in other law schools where uh, uh, they may grade to a curve. And so uh, you might, you know, find that, you know, you hear that saying, the person to your left, the person to your right, somebody's going to get disqualified. Well, that isn't true at San Joaquin College of Law. Everyone can advance if they meet the standards. So there's no curve. And what we value about that is that it creates a very, very collaborative environment where people work together and help each other to succeed. There's 86 units that you'll be co uh, completing to get your law degree, and you can do it in three, four, or five years. So all of our students start out in the four-year track, and in a minute, I'm going to share with you a sample schedule so you can see for yourself what classes you would be taking in your first year. And we start everybody out with those four classes. If you're a parent or working full-time or juggling quite a bit, you can also opt to only take three classes. That is your choice. Um, but we do, we do encourage students to start out with four classes. After the first year, if you are doing strong in all of those classes, you have the option to advance and try to finish the, our law school program within three years. Our faculty, we have 10 full-time faculty members and 30 adjuncts. So um, you will be in classes with folks that are full-time professors, as well as those professors that are out working in the field. Our student body, we have approximately half identify as minority groups. And this is very different than what you're going to see in the legal profession. Uh, we really are committed to helping anybody who has the desire to become an attorney, 
to be able to be admitted. Uh, this past year, I think it was um, over 50% of our incoming class uh, identified as first generation college students. And the year prior to that, it was over, I think 65%, 67% of our incoming class identified as first generation college students. And so we have built in academic support programs to help people who may not have an older sibling, brother or sister, mother or father or uncle who has gone before them and has um, become an attorney. So just know that if this seems overwhelming to you, there are resources to help you, to support you uh, to achieve this goal. The age range of our students is 22 to 50. We are seeing an increase in students who are coming straight out of college, uh, but we do have many folks that are second and third and fourth career people that go through law school. So you're never too young or too old to go to law school. Uh, I love the story that um, one of our professors always tells where he has um, a student knocking on his door and he's it, it's one of the um, older students who's knocks on his door and he says, Professor Artinian, here I am with all these young whippersnappers fresh out of college who have great study skills and, and um, seem to know what they're doing. And, you know, I haven't been in college for 20, 30 years. I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, he pats him on the back and says, you know, don't worry. We're in this together. We're all in this boat together. Um, you're going to be fine. And and then two seconds later, he gets another knock on the door from a younger student who, who says, uh, Professor Artinian, here I am with all these older students who've already owned their own businesses and, and know how to write contracts and know how to do things. And I'm fresh out of college. How am I ever going to survive with these more uh, mature adults? And uh, I just love that story because it really goes to show that you're in it together. You are learning a whole new language and you're there to support one, each, one another, no matter if you're fresh out of college and you're 22, or if you're 50 and you're um, entering a second or third career. We do admit about um, 70 to 100 students every year, and uh, we still are accepting applications all the way through June 30th. So uh, feel free to reach out to Francisco Rosas or myself if you have any questions about applying uh, for this year. I know in our audience we have quite a few applicants, so welcome. We're super excited to have you. And I also noticed there's quite a few um, people that are looking at fall 2021 and beyond. So thank you for being here. Here is a, a picture of our sample schedule. The first uh, one is our sample day schedule. So you'll see that uh, you'll be taking classes Monday through Thursday. The day classes run in hour and a half blocks and you have the class twice a week. So for example, contracts runs from 11 to 1220 on Mondays and Wednesdays in an hour and a half block. And torts runs on Mondays and Wednesdays from 130 to 250 also in hour and a half blocks. So if you're interested in the day schedule, um, that is the day schedule. And um, I would say that uh, it's a much smaller class. There's fewer people that have the luxury of going to class during the day. Uh, so if you would like to be in a very small cohort, that is an option for you. Our entire program cannot be completed in the day, uh, but our entire program can be completed through our evening program. So you'll see on the bottom uh, chart, that is a sample of our evening schedule. Classes run from 6.30 to 9.30 at night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, and they're in three hour blocks. And uh, some students choose to do a combination of the two, taking some day classes and some night classes to um, reduce the amount of days they have class, and that is an option for you. So we're super excited that we bring this to you and we have these different options for you to build a, a, a program that works for you. Looks like we have a question. Can you have a mixture of day and night classes? Absolutely, you can do the mixture of day and night classes. Thank you for that question. Uh, our, our, most of our students are working adults. And so you will see that the majority of our students are in the evening program. 
that is the most popular program. Our next slide is talking about all the enrichment opportunities that you can have uh, while you're in law school. So um, in addition to the four classes that you'll be taking, you can also choose to be involved in these activities. You will hear from some of our students on our panel that they do not recommend being involved in activities until after your first year. Successfully get through that first year. The first year is the hardest. I bet you can, if you like, join. We have all these different opportunities. Our new American Legal Clinic, if you're interested in becoming an immigration attorney, this is an outstanding opportunity that we have right on our campus. So um, please um, find out more information if that's your, your dream is to become an immigration attorney. We also have the Bren Clinic. The Bren Clinic is a new clinic that is helping those uh, with special needs. So if you're interested in becoming a lawyer that is providing services uh, to families who have children or family members with special needs, um, do know that we have a Bren Clinic right on our campus. And if you know anybody in the community that is looking to achieve um, their citizenship, um, please refer them to our new American Legal Clinic or if you know anybody in the community that's looking for information on how to support their loved ones with special needs, uh, please uh, refer them to our Bren Clinic. You also have the opportunity while you're a student to participate in different com competitions. The Trainer Moot Court our students have participated in, UC Davis Asylum and Refugee Law Moot Court competition, and the UCLA Cyber Crime Moot Court competition. All of those we have had our students go on to and and compete. You'll see the photo in this slide shows three of our students who took home the trophy uh, from the Trainer Moot Court competition. We also have several clubs on our campus that you are welcome to join. Uh, the Student Bar Association, our um, uh, Delta Theta Phi fraternity, our organization called Law Students United in Tolerance, and our um, law students in community advancement. So uh, feel free to seek out more information on any of those clubs and organizations. And there's been a few more clubs that have opened up as well. At this point of our program, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, um, Francisco Rosas, who's gonna take you through all the steps to uh, apply to law school. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Dan. Welcome everyone. All right, so who gets admitted, right? That's probably gonna be the next question here. And it's very important that we all kind of uh, think about what it is that each institution is looking for. Um, so our institution and every law school is kind of be kind of like the same, but our institution is gonna be looking for a bachelor's degree in any major. We're gonna look for a 3.0 GPA or better, right? Um, we look at a, at a holistic view of that applicant so it, it's a little bit more complicated than just the base numbers and that's it. Um, so that being said, we look for an outside score of 150. The outside goes from 120 to 180 uh, points. That's the range score that they go. We look for the 150 mark. Again, um, holistic view. So I'll come back to that right now. There's going to be other components that we look for as well. And some of them are going to be uh, letters of recommendation. We do need three letters of recommendation from your professors. Uh, that's what we look for. If you have someone in the community that is an attorney, that would be a great letter of recommendation to as well, right? They do have to know you. Uh, that way they can write about who you are and uh, what kind of uh, experience you bring to the institution. Um, if you've been at a school for a while, don't know anyone in the community, then the letter of recommendation could also come from a supervisor or a colleague, somebody that's known you for a while. Did you say, so I got a question here. It says, did you say two letters of recommendation? I'm sorry, I'm, I might have, uh, it's three letters of recommendation. So we'd look for three. Um, and again, from an attorney, a professor is what we look for, but that would be the ideal um, places to come from. Uh, so it's three letters of recommendation. We're gonna need a personal statement from you. Who are you, right? Uh, why do you wanna go to law school? What challenges have you faced in higher education and how have you overcome those uh, obstacles? And so one of the things is that we are gonna need to hear what kind of challenges have you faced, right? So for example, when I wrote my personal statement, I spoke about how 
I came back as a wounded veteran from the Iraq war and how I didn't let that stop me from continuing my, my education. And as a first generation college student, right, it was another barrier. I spoke about that. So they want to hear the story of who you are. So that's going to be one of the components that's going to make up your, your application there. Um, and so that being said, right, if you have a bachelor's degree, if you have 3.0 or better, an outside score, uh, 150 or better, and if your personal statement, you know, you write it well, the next thing is going to be that we're definitely going to be trying to see um, how to differentiate you, right? Like what makes you you and what makes you unique. So with the personal statement, you want to make sure that you write well. Um, this whole law school experience is going to be a big writing on a place. So you will need to be uh, well written and make sure that you, that you get somebody to proofread it. So with that, right, when you get those four components ready and set, if you have your bachelor's 3.0 or better, your outset score could be, you know, a little bit lower, not that much, but could be a little bit lower, um, 145 to 150 if your GPA is higher, right? So it off balances. Again, they look at the holistic view of if you will be successful there. Um, before I go any further, I have a question here. If anyone holds a master's degree, can the LSAT be waived? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, even to go to a PhD, you would need to take your GRE um, exam as well. So they, it is entry exams. I hold myself a, a master's degree. And we do have uh, people at our institution that do hold master's degrees and whatnot as well, uh, PhDs, as a matter of fact. And so they still have to take the LSAT. The LSAT is a little bit different, right? The LSAT is going to help the committee determine whether you will be successful with this uh, train of thoughts. Um, the the outside kind of helps them decide if you're gonna be able to do the analytical thinking um, component of it. So it's about 80% accurate. Um, you can look up some information on the outside and why the importance of it is. But um, yeah, so definitely that's, that's the way that they go with it. So I have another question here. Okay. <clears throat> Um, you had a, what, can you discuss what expected to change for classes next semester in the wake of COVID? Um, so things are, are a little bit different right now because of COVID, right? So our institution is ready for three plants right now as we are talking. So we are in the midst of looking either completely online, that's one option, right? And it just depends on the numbers of COVID situation. So completely online, we've been doing it online ever since it started in March. We're completely prepared for that, uh, providing classes for our students online. And you could actually speak to our panelists later on tonight and ask them how their experience has been so far. So that's one of the options there. The second option, it's a hybrid uh, type of deal where they would be getting our students um, safe, right? So within distance um, and to comply with COVID regulations um, of, some classes uh, online and some classes would be there. One of the things that do have to uh, state is that the exams would have to be on campus. Um, so that's, that's the second option. And then obviously the third option would be to go back to normal, which is um, not likely to happen, right? Everybody goes back to school. Um, and the truth is that that's as best as we have right now. Uh, COVID is kind of deciding for every institution, not just ours, which route we're gonna go with that. So, yeah, that's the best answer I could give on that there. And then can you go more info into associate's degree? Okay, so I can. Uh, with our institution, you, if you have an associate's degree from an accredited institution, right, uh, you can definitely apply to go to law school and it would be the same component. You will still need to take the LSAT. A caveat there is that your score on the LSAT would have to be higher, right, to kind of offset the not having the bachelor's degree there. So your LSAT score would have to be uh, closer to the 150 range, definitely 150. Your GPA would have to be higher, uh, 3.0 or better. And so those are some of the components that they would be looking at when you're doing. And then on top of that, your letters of recommendation as well from professors and um, your personal statement. And this, the associate's degree route is made for those that have life experience. Because nowadays, for example, my daughter, she's in high school, she will probably have her, most likely have her associate's degree She's been taking uh, community college courses already while in high school, and she most likely will have a associate's degree by the time she graduates uh, from high school. Um, that is not what it's meant for, right? It's meant for older 
um, students that want to go to law school, have life experience, and uh, they have their associate degree, and it just makes more sense for those students to then go ahead and get their their JD if that's the career they want to go to. So definitely, that's that's one of the the possibilities that is out there for those with associate's degree. And um, I believe that is the last question. All right. <clears throat> so again, uh, what does your application entail? Right, uh, personal statement, letters of recommendation. Um, your LSAT score, and then you would definitely need to start an account with uh, LSAC.org. That's where you would register to take the LSAT to register and pay for the LSAT and some of the other fees. And then you would also go to our uh, application, sjcl.edu, and you can start your application there. This is actually how it would look, and that's actually my application there for 2018. Um, you would just go on to the website and you don't have to finish it all in one sit down. You can simply start your application and go ahead and put your biographical information and that simply is going to help diane and myself uh, to make sure that we don't you don't fall through through uh, the cracks right we could reach out and we could offer our assistance at any given time and so you could start your application as of right now for 2021 already of course there'll be no decisions made on that application until the following cycle um right now we're really focused on this admission cycle that we're uh, currently in but this is how it would look once you would finish a certain section, it would turn green. As you can see there, uh, biographic information, it's green, uh, but I do uh, still have some missing components there that I needed to fill out. But uh, yeah, so that's how our application would look like. Next slide, please, Dan. And then this is the OUSAC um, website. So OUSAC is a little tricky. They constantly change the website, and if you need any help navigating through the website, please reach out to us. Um, they change it on us as well, but we'll figure it out uh, with you and we'll help you. So when you start this uh, journey, you have to go to OUSAC.org and you will have to go on to log in as, you will go JD applicant and you would have to put your biographic information with them as well. Now to OUSAC, you will need to turn in transcripts from any institution you have attended within the United States or Canada, okay? If you took one class at an institution, you would have to turn it in uh, to them. And so you have to turn in all transcripts to them. With South King College of Law, we only need your transcript from your undergraduate institution. So whoever granted you your undergraduate degree, that's the transcripts that we need. And we need official transcripts and OUSAC needs official transcripts as well too. Now OUSAC is also the website where you would register to take the OUSAT. Um, you would go on there, go to the OUSATs and choose a date. Uh, and location where you want to take the LSAT. Now, a little thing on the outside right now, it used to be where you go to a location and take it because of COVID again, there's uh, been some new changes, right? Adaptations, they've canceled some of the LSATs and they've completely made them online. Um, so if you'd like more information on the LSAT Flex, which the July one will be as well, uh, you could go to outside.org and kind of see what they got going on there as well. Um, so those are some of the, the opportunities there that you would be able to, to go and do. There's two more uh, fees that you would have to pay to OUSAC as well. And I'll go through them right now when we get to the other slide. But I also want to mention something that, that I forgot when, when I was talking about the associate's degree with the question. If you have an associate's degree and you want to apply to our law school, that's completely fine, right? Normal path and everything. The one thing I do have to say is that in order to apply to get uh, federal financial loans, uh, from the government to pay if that's the route you want to do. Because um, obviously, if you're going to pay out of pocket, it doesn't really concern you. But if you if that's the route, you would need to have at least 72 qualifying units for them to allow you to do that. If you don't have 72 uh, qualifying units and you only have the 60 that gives you the degree, then the first, until you reach the 72, you would not be eligible to get those um, loans from FAFSA, from the federal government. So. That's just something that I wanted to put out there before I forget. Um, there we go, next slide, thank you. So the outside registration dates, right? Um, the outside cost right now is $200. The next outside is uh, August 29th, uh, 2020, and the deadline to register for that will be July 15th, uh, 2020. Now, uh, something really quick that I need to mention on this is that this outside here would no longer um, help anybody to enroll for our school for fall 2020. It would, this outside right here would be for fall 2021, so to the following year. 
Uh, so you can start taking it now, and uh, that way you could get the score you want and get everything um, ready to go ahead of time, right? Um, South King College of Laws, and this is very important for those that are registered to take the LSAT for July or that have taken the LSAT already and are planning on attending for this fall of 2020, our application deadline is going to be on Tuesday, uh, June 30th. Now, with that said, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have to have an LSAT score by then, but you will have to have every other component completed and we will just be waiting on your LSAT score to go ahead and move along with that. So I'm gonna answer uh, some Q and A before I move on to the next slide. So uh, right now I have two questions and one of them is, will registration for fall 2020 be accepted if the student sits for the August LSAT? Well, so I think I can answer that there. Um, and the answer is no, you will have to have sit for the July LSAT. That is the last LSAT that mm -hmm. South King College of Law will accept for the fall 2020 admission cycle. Um, so unfortunately, if you didn't register prior to the date of that deadline, uh, it's gone and passed. Then the next one that we have is, how soon can fall 2021 applicants uh, begin the LSAC process tomorrow? It's simple as that. With the uh, LSAC process and even our application, like I mentioned, for fall 2021, you can start that tonight, tomorrow, as soon as you can. Um, you just have to simply, when you go into LSAC or when you're logging into the Sound King College of Law application, you have to make sure that you click on the fall 2021 uh, choice there instead of the fall 2020. Okay. And then I have one more question. You may have stated this, if you are employing uh, the hybrid model for classes, what is the percentage of in-person classes? That is still unknown. So they're still kind of working on that. And um, we obviously don't have uh, an answer for you tonight. Um, as it gets closer to the fall semester, we will have a little bit more knowledge on how that's going to work. And again, it all depends on how the numbers with hospitalization rates uh, move with COVID. And first and foremost, the uh, safety and health of our students, staff, and faculty is at the forefront of making this decision. So I just want to make sure that, um, you know, give the best answer as possible there. So I have two more questions here. When speaking of those with AA degrees, you mentioned the minimum number of hours required well, it's units required were 72. Does this mean uh, you can get your JD without your BA or BS? That is correct. You could definitely go from your associate's degree straight into your JD degree with our institution. That is not true though for other institutions that are ABA. Uh, for institutions that are California accredited, you can. So with us, that, that is true. Okay, and then I have one more question. Does the does that depending on class size too? Hmm, not sure I'm following on that question. Um, so I probably was talking about it when, when you asked that question, sorry about that. So I'm gonna go ahead for in class. Okay, yes it does. Um, so to be safe, right? It depends on the size of the class, uh, the location itself. It depends on the amount of students in the class that they're gonna be basing that off of. And I know that our administration all the way to the top are working really hard to run the numbers and see how we could possibly fit students, right? And, and professors safely in a situation where they're not gonna be worried about their health. I have here one more. Does the LSAT score expire within a 150 or higher? I can apply at any time. So yeah, your LSAT score is good for five years, right? Whether it's uh, whatever the LSAT score is, it is good for uh, five years. And some institutions could probably look at six years. It's uh, very doubtful, but that would be if your score is high enough. Uh, but it, the, the average rule is that it is good for five years. So you take it this year and it's good for five years from now. Let's see. So I have one, two more here. Uh, for those of us who will need to wait for next fall 2021 because of the waits uh, for the August, what would you, what would be the deadline for the application? So the deadline for the application each year for each fall would be in June. So the deadline for fall 2021 would be June, uh, the end of June, right? June 30th, uh, 2021. When you say 72 qualified units, what does that mean? What makes qualified units? Well, 
if you went to an institution such as Fresno City College, Clovis Community College, right, um, there's certain ways that you could get uh, graduated from there, right? You could get certificates or you could get associate's degrees. Now, if they are units that are good for an associate's degree, right, not for a certificate, then those are qualifying units. For example, if you have an associate's degree from a technical school, uh, most likely it's not an associate's degree. Uh, the most likely thing that that is, is an associate of applied science. Now, associates of applied science are not accepted by the California bar. And I wouldn't really know to tell you whether they're acceptable until you submit your transcripts to OUSAC and OUSAC would come back to you and tell you whether they are uh, qualified units. Mm -hmm. So I have a few more here. Since you stated that undergraduate official transcripts for the JD application, so if we have our master's degree and transcripts of master's, it won't qualify for the application. So any law school you go to, it does, right? If you have an, uh, a master's degree, if you have a PhD, right? Like I mentioned, we've had PhDs, we've had MDs come to our school. Um, it, it's definitely going to be worth something, right? Because now the committee is going to look at, at that person with the master's, with the PhD, and they're going to be like, okay, they've gone to a graduate school. So it's going to weigh towards the decision of helping you get into law school. So that's one of the benefits of having a master's degree. We at the institution, we only need your bachelor's um, um, transcripts. But OUSAC, you will need to turn in all the transcripts, right? Master's degree, PhD, uh, community college, if you've attended anywhere, to them. Now, when that happens, we're still gonna get those transcripts. So we will still be able to see what your uh, grades were for your master's degree as well. Okay, let's see, I think I'm almost here to the end. Has there been any concerns expressed? Oh, I lost that one. I understand that you must take uh, your OUSAC to qualify for loans. But if you are looking to pay without, so no, the, the outside is not to qualify for loans. The outside is to qualify to apply to law school. Um, to uh, qualify for loans, you need to have 72 units or more from an accredited university. So that's the answer to that one. All right. Are you familiar with the pathway to law school at Fresno City College? Yes, I am. I actually am pretty familiar with that. Um, I actually know the counselor there. Um, she's great and the professor. And uh, so we have a partnership with uh, Fresno City College, uh, Fresno State, and then South King College of Law. And so what that does, it allows students that are trying to get to law school, it's creating a pathway, a pipeline for those students. So pretty much, when you get to Fresno City, if that's where you're at, you are taking courses to be able to help you, right, with the outset, um, because you're taking analytical thinking, you're also going to be taking some courses that help you with your writing, and so uh, that's what the pathway is all about. Mm -hmm. All right, then we could go on to the next slide. So here are some other fees that apply with OUSAC. That's not with us, right? So you will have to pay for the Credential Assembly Service Report. And the cost for that is $195. That is not with us. That is through OUSAC that you would be paying uh, on top of the $200 for the OUSAC exam. And then for each law school that you want to apply to, you would also have to pay a $45 cost uh, for the law school report as well. Next slide. Thank you. All right. So currently right now, our units are $975 per unit. It takes 86 units to graduate. And there's some comparisons of what you would be paying with us versus another institution. Now, this is based on the three-year option. Most of our students, in fact, all students will come into the four-year option. You're able to move on to the four-year, to the three-year option if you do well your first year, right? And that's just going to increase more, more units, more classes in the three-year option. So therefore, the academic year for a three-year option is 28950 a year with our institution. If your first year for everyone that comes in is going to be about $20,000 because you're taking four classes instead of six. So a lot less units, a lot less money there. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether you're on the four or you're on the six year, on the four year option because it's 86 units to graduate. And 
uh, at the end of the day, your total cost for it will be 83,850. If you take student loans, right, um, they, you're able to take cost of living. So about the average uh, debt that students come out with if they're doing student loans is about 100,000. Um, when you compare that to other institutions or even with a cost of living, it's still way under that because these institutions, that's the price at 194,000 uh, for their units without cost of living. Another thing we have to take into consideration is that if you go to the Bay Area or the Los Angeles area, um, cost of living is way more expensive than it is here in the Central Valley. So that's one of the pluses that we have here going with us if you attend our institution. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our, our Director of Admissions, Diane Steele. Diane, it's all yours, thank you. Great, thank you, Francisco. Thank you so much. <clears throat> for that information. And uh, both Francisco Rosas and myself are, are happy to continue to ask, answer any questions that you might have. <clears throat> At this point, I'm super excited to bring to you our panelists and uh, Francisco is um, converting those panelists over as we speak. So um, in a minute, I'll be introducing to you um, Booker Senator Stephanie Landeros and Vladimir Pacheco. We will be inviting those panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about <clears throat> um, themselves and uh, why they, uh, where they went to undergraduate, uh, wh why they decided to go on to law school and why they chose San Joaquin College of Law. Uh, so uh, we're excited to hear their stories. Each one of them has their own story to share. Um, after they each briefly introduce themselves, then we're going to be asking, uh, inviting, we'll be asking them questions and we'll also be inviting the audience to ask them questions as well. Uh, so it uh, looks like we have uh, Booker joining us and Stephanie is joining us and we're just waiting now for Vladimir to join us. So uh, welcome um, Stephanie, welcome Booker. We're so happy that you're with us and uh, we appreciate your time. Um, go ahead, I'm gonna have ask um, Booker to turn on your video as well, and um, we'll hopefully get Pacheco, we'll get Vladimir in here shortly. So, <clears throat> well, we wait a few minutes here for um, Vladimir to join us. I just want to welcome uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. I know she just stepped out of class to join us, and Booker, thank you also for joining us. It's really wonderful to have you. Uh, so I think, um, assuming that Vladimir will be uh, zooming in and joining us as well, we may as well go ahead and get started. So uh, let's just go in alphabetical order. We'll have um, Booker uh, begin and then Stephanie and hopefully then Vladimir will be with us as well. Um, please just share with the group a little bit about yourself where you went to undergrad, uh, what was your major, uh, why you decided to go to law school, uh, whether or not you work or not, or have a family or not, um, what year you are, things like that. Just give us a little snapshot so we could get acquainted with you. And um, we won't take any questions yet to you after you do your brief intro. We're gonna hold questions until after each panelist has a chance to introduce themselves. So um, welcome. Um, Booker, go ahead and, and share with us a little bit about yourself. Oh, it looks like we need you to be unmuted. Let's see. Um, Can you hear me? I said good evening. Uh, yep. Uh, Ms. Steele and uh, Mr. Rosas, thanks for having me on as a panelist and to everybody watching. Uh, my name is Booker Senator. I am currently a 2L second year law student at San Joaquin College of Law. Uh, hold a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So I graduated from uh, Cal Poly in June of 2013. Uh, originally from Fresno, California, have roots there, uh, went to San Joaquin Memorial. Uh, you know, after college, moved around a little bit, getting into the workforce as a you know, young professional. And, uh, you know, what really drew me into law school, um, keeping it kind of brief and concise here, is that it really is a recession-proof uh, profession. Um, I know a lot of the panelists are probably quite a few years younger than me, 
but I, I remember coming out of school in that 2008 to 2012 period uh, where, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, were searching for work. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this, it's very tough to distinguish yourself um, without some sort of graduate or professional degree nowadays. I, I find that, you know, going to law school, I found myself thinking I needed to have uh, that, you know, JD, so I could really separate from the pack in an ever increasing the uh, competitive marketplace. So yeah, the versatility of having a JD, um, you can work in either the public or private industry. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of keep it nice and sweet there. And there's a few more things I'll share after everybody else gets a chance to uh, speak. Vladimir, thank you for joining us. We're just getting started. Booker just introduced himself. We're going alphabetical by first name. Next, we'll have uh, Stephanie introduce herself and give us a brief intro as far as um, where she went to undergrad, what her major is, whether she has a family or not, commuter or not. Just a little bit about yourself, why you chose San Joaquin College of Law. And then we'll hold questions at this point until after we all do the brief intros. And then we'll um, start with our questions. So thank you for joining us. We're so happy that you're here. Stephanie. Sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> uh, hello, Stephanie Landeros. Um, I don't know what BT was talking about younger than him panelists. I'm gonna be almost 40 next year, so <laughs> right there with you. It's good genes, BT, good genes. <laughs> um, but I, um, I graduated from Fresno State, uh, majored in philosophy. I majored in philosophy uh, for two reasons. Um, one, I really liked that feedback, outer limit thought process that you go through in philosophy, those high level conversations, um, but really because it was the only major that um, I thought at the time led to law school. And I had always dreamed to go to law school. Um, while I was in college, I did um, have two children um, and got married and had two children, bought a home, established a family. Um, so when I um, finished with school, I had always worked my way through school, um, school at night, work all day. And so um, it took a long time to finish. And so I needed a break. And um, the break went longer than I thought it would be while I was <laughs> working. And um, about almost 10 years went by. And I got into a profession where I was interacting with more attorneys and I realized um, my old dream was kind of haunting me and knocking me on the shoulder again and saying, hey, this is where you should be. So um, I chose San Joaquin College of Law because uh, I was already established here in the Valley. I've been in Fresno almost all of my life. My children go to school here. My husband is established in his career here. And so um, San Joaquin was the logical choice. Um, it's also the most financially beneficial choice. <laughs> and um, it, it, was, it was an easy decision for me. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. And uh, it's really, I'm so excited that you're here. I look forward to, to asking all of you more questions. But let's turn to uh, Vladimir. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. So, um, my name is Vladimir. Um, so I was in the U.S. Marine Corps uh, back in 2008, got out in 2012, went straight to school, and um, I just had a, a knack for business. And I went to University of Phoenix. I was trying to look for a full-time job, so I was working full-time, getting my bachelor in business management, and I kept on working at the VA. And I started sort of moving up pretty quickly in the VA for a young age. Um, and then I, I was an advocate for a lot of veterans and patients. And I liked, and I still like, you know, actually advocating for people. I always had a knack to, for law and history, uh, but it was a weird thing. I got in a car accident like two, two years ago, three years now. And I saw an attorney and we were just, and he just brought up the kids like, hey man, like you ever thought of becoming an attorney? And I said, yeah, I gave it a thought years ago. And he just told me, hey, what happened? I didn't have an answer. I had no answer. And I was taken back and, and it messed with me. And I told myself, you know what? I'm gonna go to law school. I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna go to law school. And she's, she broke the law. She's like, oh yeah, that's, that's cute. Sure, you'll be a lawyer. 
I went to Barnes and Noble, I think the next week and I started studying for the LSATs. I started looking for law schools around the area and I was looking at Sacramento, uh, Berkeley. My brother goes to Berkeley and all these other places. And I find myself looking at SJCL. Um, you know, I do live here, I'm married. I do have a house here too, but I just saw the staff right away, how friendly they were, uh, the instructors, how welcoming they are for any questions. And also a lot of the lawyers here in Fresno um, have went to SJCL and they had nothing but good things to say about it. And I kept on looking at their alumni, same thing, same thing nothing but good things. So it, it was an easy choice for me to come to SJCL. And honestly, um, it's, been, it's been great. Great, thank you, Vladimir. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, undergraduate students thinking about law school often ask is, what is law school like? How does it compare to undergraduate school? You know, how is it different? The classes, the tests, what it, how is it different? So I'm curious to hear each of your perspective and uh, let's just uh, go again in, in alphabetical order of your first names. And Booker, if you can address that first, thank you. Yeah, sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think most people would say in undergrad, you could skim reading you know, sometimes you could skip class. Uh, that doesn't really fly in law school, right? So I think um, your mindset and your approach has to be that you're not really going to cut any corners. You know, there's really no uh, shortcut to success, I guess is the old cliche. But, um, you know, I think when you start off, and I know a lot of the, you know, potential prospective students are kind of still in the process of deciding whether or not, they, you know, they really want to apply and, and take the LSAT. But once you get, you know, in school, I think starting at orientation, right? Uh, that's what I love about San Joaquin College of Law is everything's laid out for you, right? Um, you get your first assignments, you get, you know, with the case books, um, everything you need to get started. So I think it's, a, it's the snowball effect, right? If you get behind right off the bat, it's, uh, it's very hard to catch up. So kind of reinforcing and hammering that home is doing all of the reading. Um, I would like to say this, I mean, you'll learn these terms. I know it might sound foreign to you tonight, but you really need to brief every single case, right? And I think it's, um, and you'll hear this from your future professors one day, um, the process of messing up but doing it yourself, I find is very organic. And, you know, seeing a lot of my peers in the 1L uh, cohort that I started with, I know a lot of people were relying on like Quimby and Barbary and commercial outlines and canned briefs. I'm not gonna knock those things. I think that they're very good, but I just really wanna hammer home, you really need to own your learning, right? So um, the process of messing up and doing it yourself, and then resorting to some of the outlines from the organizations and from maybe someone who's ahead of you in the program, I, I think that's a sure way to set yourself up for success. All right, thank you, Booker. And Stephanie, what's your thoughts about how is law school different from undergraduate school? Um, I, I, I agree, um, first part with, uh, with Booker. Um, it's, it's not, as easy, if possible at all, to procrastinate like you could in undergrad. I was a major procrastinator. I always pushed it to the last limit and I pulled those all-nighters. And here in law school, it, it's not gonna work. Um, you really have to, it's a cumulative process that you learn step by step and everything tacks on to the part before and it tacks on to the part before and it tacks on to the part before. And, um, and if, if you're not reading and if you're not keeping up on notes and you're not in class getting these things, it's a lot more difficult to try and go back and learn it from scratch at the end. Because in the end, you're gonna see there's so much to memorize that memorization takes up so much of the effort that that learning and understanding you had to have already grasped beforehand. Because the last, mark, the last part where you're cramming and you're procrastinating is the memorization part. 
all of the knowledge base and understanding you would have already had to have mastered by the time it comes time for finals. Especially also another thing to consider is a lot of undergrad courses, you're graded as you go. You're graded on assignments, on papers, on group projects, on interactions, on class participation. In law school, you're not. It's all on that final exam and that's it. It is all on the table at that last part. And so there's a lot more stress involved. It's so much more intimidating. Uh, and that's the difference. Um, to answer the question that came up before, as far as are there group projects, I saw Vladimir kind of answered there really aren't any group projects. However, um, you might see some group projects in, um, in the elective courses. Um, but again, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're gonna affect your grade as much as it is to get an interact and understanding there. Um, and then there's moot court, which requires partners. And that is um, one course that requires that you're with a partner the entire time building a, um, a, a paper, a brief, a proposal, and also your oral presentation. Great, thank you, Stephanie. That's really comprehensive. And Vladimir, what are your thoughts? I see that you're still on mute, so you want to unmute yourself, but I'm interested in what are your thoughts about how it's different? Um, very different. Um, very, very, very different. Um, so if not for nothing, there is a book out there I would encourage all of you to read. It's called 1L. Uh, it's about a Harvard Law School student. It's pretty much like an excerpt or an autobiography of a person's first year in law school. Okay. I, Highly encouraged to do it, it's $12, pick it up, read it. And a lot of the emotions, a lot of things they go through sort, sort of really resonate here, um, especially given the fact that I've never been, never been around so many smart people, it's one of the few things, uh, to say the least, because it takes a certain personality to go to law school, but just being around so many people at your screen level, if not more, it's sort of just this competition at all times. And I think it sort of motivates everybody to do better. And that's one of the good things that uh, I noticed right off the bat from undergrad, undergrad to uh, law school is that you're gonna make yourself better. Whether you realize it or not, you're gonna put that time or effort. If you see a person briefing a case, you wanna do better than that. Because this is competition to do better. Um, so there's a difference there. Um, there's competition, I, I believe. And I think it's good competition because also, I noticed that I was looking at the dictionary way more than the grad, so be ready for that. I have a dictionary on hand. You will definitely to um, understand what you're reading. Um, not actually skimming and reading, but actually retaining it. What Stephanie said earlier, um, throughout the classes, you're, you're building upon this at the end, and, and at that point, you're just reviewing. So uh, it's definitely a difference there. Um, also, another thing that Stephanie touched on, it's not like undergrad where you could have a measuring stick of, well, on assignment one, I did this, and assignment two was here, and assignment five, I did this. It's the final. It's the final. So you just, uh, obviously at the end, we're just memorizing all your material. That's the easy part. The hard part is just knowing what to ask yourself and I mean, what you don't know, explore that. Ask other people, ask your teachers, and that's one of the big things there is just to rely on others. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, we have a question from the audience, um, and it is, if you are looking to attend law school without incurring debt, are there payment plans available? What is the typical deadline for tuition for each student? Maybe at your comfort level, maybe um, you might want to address your thoughts on the, how you have chosen to afford law school. Maybe we'll start with Stephanie. What are your thoughts there? Um, well, I, um, I'm a mother of two. Um, I have a daughter who's just entered high school and another um, who's in elementary. Um, we just got out of the daycare phase. So on that, that's a big deficit. <laughs> um, um, I own a home um, and everything that comes with that type of a lifestyle has its own, own bills. And so um, I took out student loans, government loans for the first time in my life. 
I went through all of my undergrad school paying out of pocket. I put it on a credit card at the beginning of the semester and I paid it off. So by the end of the semester, it was zero. And so when I finished school, I had no, no school debt. Law school is my first time taking out major loans. And that's just kind of what I'm living on right now. Um, it really is only enough just to cover tuition, um, not even books, really. Um, so I'm just getting tuition and I haven't even paid a cent on it yet. So thank goodness for those federal loans being deferred. Um, and right now I kind of just put it on the back burner and I'm going to cross that bridge when I get to it once school is over. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, it's a tremendous investment in yourself. So it's really awesome to hear you say that and worry about it later. But for now, let's see what, um, Booker, what are your thoughts on okay. it? So I want to answer uh, Kyle's question. Is it Zoldowski? I hope I didn't butcher your last name there, pal. But no, uh, real quick, and then I'll answer your question, Miss Steele. I you literally use the table of contents in my you know casebook for whatever class. So I think earlier in the program tonight, they told you you'll take civil procedure, contracts, torts, and you know legal methods, which is a legal research and writing class. Um, as I started off with the first question, I said, you know, brief every case. And I don't want to get into that because you'll learn from your professors how to do that. But I believe this worked for me. I simultaneously worked on my outline after, you know, I would brief a case, right? Because kind of like some of my peers have said, you don't want to get behind the eight ball. So you don't want to wait until late October, early November to, you know, start your outline, right? Because as she, you know, Stephanie said eloquently, you got to really memorize these things, right? And I'm a guy, you know, I'm old school, right? I use the whiteboards at the law school and the, the pre-COVID world, right? We, we were actually able to go, but I would write things down, right? A million times in repetition. I know uh, Dean Tenerelli, you know, Dean of Students talks about mnemonic devices. Um, a lot of people like to use flashcards. So Kyle, I hope I answered your question there. Okay, back to the whole like a uh, money topic. Uh, you know, I'm gonna just be a straight shooter and super transparent here. Um, I'm single, I'm a bachelor, right? So it's a little easier for me. Uh, you know, maybe one day, you know, wife and kids and all that if it's in the future. But I would say look to uh, faith-based organizations, civic groups, Rotary Club, maybe your parents know someone you did an internship for in the summer. There's all types of organizations that are, you know, willing to give you scholarship money. So that's definitely something I would look at. Um, I want to say this publicly to Vladimir, thank you for your service. You know, as he mentioned, you're a veteran. I know there's the GI Bill, Yellow Ribbon Bill. Uh, and he can give you all the info there. And Miss Milmeyer, you know, she's great with that. And, you know, Sometimes you just have to really look deep within yourself and sacrifice. I mean, I, I made a choice to downsize, okay? Uh, sometimes you can't have the fancy, you know, big house and the nice condo. You, you might have to live in an apartment for a couple of years. Uh, you might have to give up that luxury car and eating out five nights a week. You know, I, I went back to packing lunches like I did in middle school. Um, there's always ways to cut corners, right? But this is very doable. Um, yeah, that was a part of moving back to the Central Valley. As everyone said earlier tonight, the uh, tuition, you know, if you were to go to law school in the Bay Area or Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and, you know, Miss Steele, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you're looking at like $12.50 a unit, $12.75 a unit, and then cost of living, right? So civic groups, faith-based groups, military service, if you have that, and living within your means for three or four years. It's, it's really not that hard if this is something that's your passion and your purpose and, and you really wanna do it. Thank you, thank you, Booker. So yes, there's definitely some creative ways to afford law school. If you go to our website and look under financial aid, there's um, some information dedicated to outside scholarships as well as as you advance through the program, we have internal scholarships that alums and different people have uh, contributed to um, but Vladimir, do you have any other thoughts for students who are intimidated by that ticket, you know, that big expense? Um, half of it's due in, in August and the other half is due in, in January, but I'm interested in what your thoughts are on, on it as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. So 
Yeah, so I did use a GI Bill previously from an undergrad and uh, bachelor's degree. So, you know, I'm, I'm pulling loan um, for this. So I'm pretty familiar uh, with this here. So the way I looked at it, um, I, I thought about it. I'm like, okay, so what's my benefit? What am I getting out of this? You know, I want to become a lawyer. I want to, you know, uh, advocate. I want to make a difference here in Fresno or, or in California, right? Or I, I got dead. Well, I don't want to deal with that. You know, so I waited, I waited out. And honestly, I, the way I justified it was that I'm making an investment in myself, not only to me, but to my wife, uh, to my future children, and to people out there too. Not only that, but I, you know, I, I own a home too. You know, I'm already investing in that, but there's, there's you know, frivolous spending that we all make. And honestly, when I just pull back a little bit, it doesn't really hinder me that much. So I just saw an investment. I still find an investment. Even after just finishing my first year, I feel like a different person than I was last year. This time last year, I think I was, I just got my uh, acceptance letter. I was just studying for my LSATs this time last year. And here I am doubling up in summer uh, classes. I finished my finals. I passed my first year and I feel like I already gained enough, some more knowledge than I did last year. But you got Stephanie over here who has even more than that. So you, you, you're, you're seeing an improvement. And honestly, it, you get so much out of it. Uh, you, I really can't put a price tag on that. So you know what? I justified it as an investment. And so far, it's been the best investment I made. It's really fun to hear you all say that you're um, noticing how much your own knowledge is, is increasing while you're in classes, and that's super exciting. You know, there's, there was a question and there's a common theme of um, how do you juggle your um, personal life if you're a parent or if you're married or even, uh, Booker, if you're not, how do you juggle your, or manage your time. So I'm curious to hear from all of you your tips on strategies of, of managing time through law school. And then we'll come to the, the next question too about um, how much time do you have to commit? Or maybe you wanna weave it into it, but how much time do you have to commit to studying um, when you're a student in law school? And um, why don't we start with you, Booker? Sure, yeah, um, great question there. Time management's key. Um, look. You can still have fun. You know, it's not like your life ends when you go to law school. So I don't want you to be, you know, super intimidated. You know, I mean, work hard, play hard, you know, within reason. Um, but I look at it kind of like a, like a steady diet, right? So in the beginning, you don't know what class is going to be your strong suit, right? So I look at it like literally devote an equal amount of energy and attention. And like I say, maybe come like, I don't know, late October after you had a practice midterm, you'll know which class you can kind of put a little less time in or vice versa where you need to press a little bit. Um, like for me, for example, like civil procedure was like my best class, right? But torts was something that I really had to put a little extra time into. So first part of my answer there is steady diet, right? Don't overdo it on one class because you're, you know, you're not getting it done in the other three classes. I personally found that legal methods uh, and my peers, they might have a different experience, but that class I felt like took the most time. I don't think mm -hmm. it was necessarily the most difficult, but it, it seemed like it took the most time in the first year. And Fridays, I know they gave you a sample schedule there with the PowerPoint presentation. Friday is not a day to take off, right? That's a day if you are a parent, if you do work, use that to get caught up. I know a lot of people that work full time, they just basically gave up their weekends. Whereas if you're not working, you know, maybe on Saturday, like you can go play nine holes of golf or, you know, you can go out on a date or whatever, but uh, you'll find that balance as you go. Like I said, you know, it's kind of early in the process, so I don't want to like scare you off, but yeah, Fridays don't take them off. And if you need a certain environment, like for me, I think Stephanie and Vlad will tell you guys I love to talk. I think some of you are picking up on that tonight. <laughs> but, um, I would have to isolate myself, right? Because I'm just a social, like, outgoing person. So literally, like, I would go to school because if I was in that academic environment or if I was at Starbucks by myself, I couldn't get, you know, off task. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Booker. That's good. And how about you, Stephanie? What are your thoughts? 
Um, so law school takes a lot of time, a lot of time. And the reading assignments are massive. You are really getting hundreds of pages to read each night for each class. Um, so um, I take Fridays off. I work all day from eight to five, Monday through Friday. And I come to school 6.30 to 9.30, Monday through Thursday, okay? There's not a lot of time for homework or reading in there. I may, on a good night, get some reading in when I get home at 10 o'clock at night and read wow. until midnight, right? Yeah. And then get up at five in the morning and get ready for work. Wow, five hours of sleep? Yes, yeah, that's the life. That is <laughs> the life of law school, especially when you're working. Friday nights were family nights. Those are the nights I get home from work and those are the nights we have dinner as a family, we watch a movie, I play games with the kids. Weekends from sun up to sundown is reading and studying because there's four courses that you're doing homework for and I'm doing them all in two days, Saturday and wow. Sunday with a little bit of reading in between. Mm -hmm. So um, balancing it with family and everything else, I, I take my books to karate tournaments, soccer fields, volleyball tournaments. Um, some of those tournaments are three days long and I go two days to watch, one day the whole day by myself in the hotel doing homework. Um, you find a way to make it balance. Um, it, it, it's a lot, but like Booker said, as time goes by, you do also kind of work your way, you learn your way. Well, this class, maybe I don't have to read all of the briefs. Mm -hmm. I'll read the first few ones and get the conclusions on the others and I'll wing it in class and hope I don't get called on. Um, <laughs> take good notes. <laughs> You work it out for what works best for you um, and for your family, and um, you learn some humility, and um, and you make it work. So it's doable. It's definitely doable, um, but there are some sacrifices. There's definitely sacrifices. You know, there's yeah. parties you miss. You're not going to all of the cousins and the nephews and nieces' birthday parties, and you're not staying late for all the weddings. Um, so but it's, it's, it's a short period of time for a long-term investment. That's awesome way of putting it, a short period of time for a long-term investment. And uh, yes, I've heard some of our grads say that the hardest thing about law school is having to say no to the people that you love the most, you know, and, put, and make some sacrifices and put some limits. So I hear you there, um, Stephanie. Uh, I, I'm curious, uh, Vladimir, you, you work full time, you're, you're married. Um, you said you work sometimes 45 hours a week. How do you, what are your tips for managing time? Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, I do work 45 hours a week. I work from seven to 4.30 every day, um, but I'm married too. So I have to balance that as well too, right? So, I mean, the first thing I did, I don't know if you guys are married, and the, and the attendees, but you know, it's, it's a commitment on both sides, on her side and my side. Um, so that's the biggest thing. If you are married, know that, that you know, your, your relationship's gonna be impacted, um, mm. you know it or not. So that being said, um, you know, I would go to work. I, I'm there at seven, I take off at 4.30, uh, wow. drive to SJCL from the president of VA to SJCL. Um, I'll talk to my wife for a little bit. I'll get to SJCL, I eat my food right there in the truck. I, that's just what I do. I eat my food in the truck and I go straight to the library and I try to pound out like an hour or an hour and a half studying or going back to class notes for the last time or think about the after class. Go to class so 6.30 to 9.30. I get off, get home, spend some time with my wife and I try to, I really try to at least put 30 minutes or an hour just going back to my notes or you know whatever, make some notes or doing my outline. Saturdays and Sundays are nothing but reading. I wake up at seven o'clock in the morning. I will wake up at seven or 7.30, I'll get my coffee, and I'm in the books. I'm in the books from eight till 8 p.m. easily. That, that, <clears throat> seven. Um, so just know that, um, that's how I manage my time. I devote my weekends for uh, reading and outlining and things of that nature. 
but just like Stephanie, I take Friday off. <laughs> I take you have to take for me. I have to take day off Friday. I, don't, I try not to talk about law school. Uh, it's so easy to just talk about law, torts, contracts. Like all you can just talk. You know. Yeah. It sounds interesting, and it is interesting. But you know, uh, I have to shut it off for you know that one night. <laughs> so, a weekly date night, you know, to keep you know keep sane. But uh, yeah, weekends even now are, are devoted to reading. So what Stephanie said, you read hundreds of pages. So you, you want to you're on top of your reading. You want to make sure you're on top of your reading. So you want to devote as much, as much time as you want to. So just know that. that you, you mentioned uh, Vladimir, and I want to invite the audience also, if you have additional questions, um, you can raise your hand and we could turn your video, we could invite you to turn your video on if you'd like. And you could ask a question to our panelists, um, and we welcome you to do that. Or feel free to continue in the Q and A as you're doing. But Vladimir and Stephanie, both you mentioned that you're married, and you mentioned you know having agreements with your partner that it's a sacrifice. How did you establish that? Did you both just discuss it before you went into law school and said, "Look, this is just something we're gonna have to do"? How did you work that out with your partners? Well. Um... I, uh, yeah, basically, I think you had this initial conversation. So my husband came with me to the orientation. Mm -hmm. Okay, they say bring your spouse. And it's important that they come because the dean gets up there and she lays it all out. And other students come up and they tell you this is what it's going to be and this is what is expected and this is the demand and if they hear it from them as well as from you and it's not just you saying hey I need more time and it's like well because is it because you're slacking off you're not studying as much it's because it just requires that much time um, but even still there's like this preliminary conversation that's kind of lighthearted. that's like oh you know I'm kind of happy to have some homework and you know this is going to do and then when you really get into it, then you have another conversation and you're like, whoa, I really need this time. And I'm sorry, I thought I could do this and that, but it, I can't. I'm gonna really have to ask you to really step up and help me out. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a very strong support system. My husband does it all. He does it all. He does the laundry. He cooks dinner. He made arrangements with his mom to split. Uh, we used to do the divide and conquer, right? You have two kids, you got two parents, you do the divide and conquer. You take one to music, you take the other one to sports. Um, so he made arrangements with um, his mom to help out and do the divide and conquer with the two kids so that I could have the time that I needed to, one, I'm, I feel like an absentee parent, honestly. Monday through Thursday, I'm not around. The girls don't even see me. I'm gone before they get up in the morning and I'm home after they're in bed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he has, you have to have a good strong support system to really fill in those gaps. And it does take a lot of open communication. And mm -hmm. honestly, just like Vladimir said, that time, a lot of conversations happen in the car now. Mm -hmm. The drive from work to school is catching up with all the people you haven't talked to in days one of which is your spouse to kind of catch up and be like, hey, what happened today? What's the major stuff? Give me the hot topics. Okay, great. I'll address that when I get home. Hey, sister, I haven't seen and heard from in two, three weeks. All right, how are your kids doing? Okay, I got 30 minutes. You go off the road, people can't drive. And you know, you keep going and you're, you're doing all of this at once. You learn to multitask your life. Mm -hmm. And everything is on a schedule. I schedule everything is on a schedule. Breaks are on a schedule. And, um, and yeah, it, it takes a regular sense of communication and you really do need to sometimes take that time. So those, those nights when you get home at 10 o'clock at night, just like Vladimir, I sit down on the couch and I have a conversation with my husband. How was your day? What did the so, girls say? What did that happen? So, and that's basically how, it, 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 yeah, you gotta talk all the time and you gotta let them know where you're at and what you're going through. And you gotta be able to still take that time to listen to what they're going through because their life is changing just as much as your are, yours is because they're making so many adjustments around your adjustments. 
Right. So it sounds like we should have a panel of spouses someday to talk about <laughs> how to be the best support for your spouse who's in law school. And, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've heard people say you just got to keep your eye on the end prize and that the whole family is eventually going to benefit from this and that you'll be able to switch roles and, and nurture your spouse as they've been nurturing you through all of this. So I really commend you for, for finding a way to make all that work. Anything else you wanted to add there, Vladimir, before we move on? Yeah, I'll, I'll real quickly, same thing with Stephanie's. It's, it's funny because I just want to let everyone know we didn't talk about this beforehand. But I did the same thing. I brought my wife to orientation. I did the exact mm -hmm. thing. And so, yeah, you have the conversation before law school. But I think uh, it's about the percent of gravity of what you're going through once they hit orientation and hear exactly what she said, like, word for word, what's going to happen. So I think that helped out tremendously for them to understand that it's the commitment on both sides and that there can be hours and night, there can be stressful day. Uh, no, it's going to happen, and you need a strong support system, just like what Stephanie said. You need buy in from your spouse and understanding on both sides. Um, as a person going to law school, you have to be understanding of your spouse of what they're going through. So, even though you're jumbled up doing all this work, studying, outlining, you still got your, your significant other to worry about and to think about. And so, it's, it's a balancing act, which at a certain point, a middle ground. So just know that. Awesome, thank you. Um, Booker, I'm so grateful you're managing to adjust to the daylight <laughs> turning tonight and um, hanging in there with us. Yeah, thank I'm at so the uh, Bob Hope International Marriott, the airport here in Burbank. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, uh, so okay. you, you've I really adapted. You're, you're, you're <laughs> learning to adapt to this whole COVID-19. You know, and, and, Let's shift gears. Let's talk a little bit about what was that like for you adapting to law school under these circumstances. I'm seeing a few questions about that. Maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, um, I, I tried to answer a couple there in the uh, Q and A in the chat while my peers were chatting there. I want to I want to say this really quick. It's a little off in the weeds, but I think it's important. Um, I know a lot of people that are paralegals law clerks, they worked at firms. Okay, I don't wanna sound disrespectful, but forget everything you learned out there in your day job, right? I, I don't know if you guys have heard the saying, like when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? So I think, no, that, that's very important, right? Because sometimes we think we know more than we do, all right? And in turn, that can set us up for failure when it comes to taking these exams, right? So take that for what it means. If you want to inbox me later, or if you see me on campus, I, I'll give you more on that. Back to your question. Um, you know, it's a collaborative effort. I know you mentioned that we don't necessarily curve or compete with our peers. So in this ever changing world, COVID-19, you need, you might need to rely on your peers more than you ever have before, right? Because you don't necessarily have that same accessibility to the professor. I know for me, uh, you know, I got frustrated. You know, I'm going to speak my truth here for a minute because class moves so fast, all right, that you don't necessarily have time to get all your questions answered, right? So for me, uh, instead of getting more and more frustrated, I said, if I want to get through this, I would start to write my questions down in the margin of my case brief or whatever notepad I had in front of me, right? And I would ch cross it off or check it off if the professor answered it, right? So I think as we all adapt and adjust as best we can, uh, especially for you guys coming in, starting law school like this, you know, I've, none of us have really started law school like that, right? Um, emailing your professors, is going to be very like imperative that you do that. But I, I want to, you know, warn you that don't waste their time, right? So if you haven't done the reading, if you haven't done the practice essay, like if you aren't really prepared to engage in the Socratic method, and you'll learn more about what that means depending on the professor you have, there's no point of going to office hours, right? I mean, time, money, energy is being spent everybody you know on this you know webinar is an adult 
So you can either cram all this stuff the last two weeks and pray that, you know, you memorized enough or you can have the discipline to kind of take it in morsels, digest it and have it down because like Stephanie said, and I'm going to say this again, if you have less things to memorize at the end and you're spending that time refining your skill set, doing practice essays, getting feedback from the professor, it's going to serve you well at the end. So that's the COVID thing. Uh, I want to say this because you might not ask this question. Learn how to use the word because, when and where a lot. You know, you're going to set up a lot of dependent clauses. This is not the time to show everybody how eloquent you are, how wordy you are. It's not the time to be the most enlightened person in the classroom. You know, it's not the time to one up the person sitting next to you or try to make the professor look stupid. Right. It's, it's a time to really be a sponge. And I'm, I'm still learning this. Right. I'm a 2L. So I've still got a few years to go. Um, less is more. Awesome. Sometimes. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I know we're, we're running out of time and I want to give our panelists an opportunity to close. Um, uh, gives up some your your closing argument here for for law school. No, your your highlight. What is something that you like best about law school? But while we give them, yeah, I'm almost finished. Yeah, all right, thanks. All right. Sorry, it was a buddy passing by there. Oh uh, no, no problem. So while we um, give you all a chance to think about what you'd like to close on for tonight, um, we do want to ask all of our attendees to participate in a very uh, short five question poll. Uh, so, uh, Francisco Rosas, uh, I think you are going to put a poll up for our panelists to answer, or I, I actually am launching it here. So, I believe I just launched a quick poll. It's only five questions. We appreciate all of our attendees to respond to this poll, and um, it's just five quick questions. So, if you can take a minute to do that, all of our attendees, we appreciate it. <clears throat> And uh, while they're doing that, our panelists, I just can't thank you enough for your time. It's so special to us that you took this time out of your busy lives and your families and uh, your communities and classes to spend time with us and answer questions and help remove these barriers uh, for people thinking about going to law school. So in closing, if you would just give some thought to um, what's something that you like best about your experience so far uh, in going to law school. And I'll give you a minute to think about that while we just give people a chance to, to finish the, the five question uh, poll that we're running. Did you have a specific order for that? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear the order you wanted for the closing. Um, you know what, let's just um, go with uh, you, uh, Booker, if you can start in a minute as soon as we end this polling. Share with okay. us some, something that you like best about law school. And then I know you're in a public setting, so feel free to, to log off once you finish. Um, we're so grateful for your time, Booker. And then we'll go to um, Latimer, if you could go next, and we'll end with Stephanie um, to share with us uh, something that you like best about your experience so far in law school. And uh, Javier, if you can give me the heads up if you think we have enough response to this polling or if you want me to leave it open for a couple more minutes. Um, it looks good. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling for now. And um, let me close this and then we'll go to, we'll begin with, with uh, Booker, if you can share with us um, what is it that you like best about law school? All right. So your polling is done. Here we go. I wrote this down while they were polling so I could, you know, keep it nice and brief. From day one of law school, everything you learn is relevant. It's going to help you in some way. You're dealing with real life scenarios, hypotheticals. All right. And you look at all of the civil and social unrest. I could not think of a better time to be in law school than right now, right? Certain points in society, regardless of how you feel. I think like 1968, I think when we all sit here 20, 30 years from today, 2020 is gonna be a year like 1968, right? So you can either be on the outside looking in 
or you can have some skin in the game. All right. Um, I find what I like the most about law school is that you're preparing yourself to have a seat at the table, right? Um, you actually have credibility and, you know, hopefully when we all finish and we're on the other side and looking back, um, you'll say you now have the abilities to make wrongs right. Okay. Um, other people, you know, go to law school right out of undergrad. Some of us have some work experience and some uh, real world experience and knowledge. Um, I think that you cannot help others, right, until you've helped yourself. So for anybody who's ever taken a flight, you hear the flight attendant say, in the event of an emergency, put your own mask on first before you help the person next to you. I can't help the person next to me or be an advocate for them unless I have that tool set that skill set and that foundation right so whatever you want to do with this degree you know really find your purpose know that everything you're learning is relevant and you need to know the rules to the game before you jump in the game and want to start changing things so that's my closing argument i hope you apply to law school i sincerely hope you come to san joaquin college of law and if Six months down the road, if this, you know, helped you just come up to me and say, hey, man, you know, I was at that webinar on Zoom. I can't see any of your faces. But, yeah, uh, 2020 is a, yeah, it's an interesting year. I'll, I'll believe it at that. But going to law school will help you, you know, deal with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your comments, Booker. And it's so great to have you join us tonight. And um, thank you so much for your time. All right, I'm going to get up out of here. Love you guys. Okay. All right, I got to go. <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you. And, and Vladimir. Oh, let's see. Let me, let me, oh, there, you go. Go. there we go. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's so many things to really talk about my <laughs> first year of law school, um, but there's only a couple of points I just want to bring out. Um, I've always been inquisitive, I always like knowing the why and things I always have. I've always that weird guy who was just stay up at night reading notes and, and newspapers and articles over and over again just to understand the world. You're going to get that in law school. You're going to understand the why and, and aspects of society, whether it be in contracts, would be uh, in towards to legal methods, administrative law, copyrights, whatever the case might be. You're going to understand the why. And it's pretty cool that you're filling all these gaps that mm. the rest of society has. If you think about it, a lot of people don't go to law school and you know, you, you see it, whatever people have opinions on everything, but there's, there's, there's only really one piece of law. You know what I mean? So you understanding that <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Just, just having have an inquisitive mind and just being fed, you know, the why. And so, yeah, I, I learned a lot in my first year. Um, my, analytical thinking improved tremendously. Um, so even now, um, I'm seeing it like working out for me. Uh, I'm a manager at the VA hospital. Um, so I do like a lot of decision making and things of that nature, but I could actually take a step back and I catch myself sort of like seeing it unfold logically. And if, if something doesn't make sense to me, I speak out immediately. And I'm like, how can you guys make this logical jump from here to here? How's that work? You know what I mean? And then, and I try wow. to break it down and I call it breaking it down Barney style. You know what I mean? Cause you, you think so, so much so at once, I just try to break it down into a bite sized chunk. And even in less than one year, I'm already capable of wow. making these big ideas into smaller things and spoon feed it to people. So I already took that away in my first year. So I got more to go, but there's a lot to learn at law school and it's going to show. Um, awesome. We're going to see it. So, so that. awesome, Vladimir. You're an inspiration. It's neat to see that you're feeling like you're already able to offer something um, to people with what you've learned so far. That is so exciting and such an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much. And feel free to stay on if you're able to for a few more minutes. Yeah, uh, um, I'll stay on if people still have questions. I'll, I'll be here. Okay. And Stephanie, how about you? What are your What do you like best about your experience so far? So my initial drive to going to law school is I'm going to speak out for all those people who grew up 
watching Matlock with their parents and Perry Mason and Murder, She Wrote and wanted to be Judge Judy when they grew up because I wanted to be Judge Judy when I grew up. And that was the initial drive. Um, but like Vladimir has said, he, he describes his character and his thought process, his analytical mind and always wanting to know the why and always having this inquisitive um, aspect to himself and asked a lot of questions. And you come to law school and it's interesting because you feel like you're the only person going through this in your mind. You're the only person feeling these things. You're the only person stressing out. You're the only person going. And it's like everybody is thinking the same thing. Every other student, you're like, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was saying. That's where I'm stuck at. That's where my problem issue was. You know, we're all saying the same thing. And it was, it, it was odd. It, it was interesting, but it was fun. I've always liked challenges. Um, I've never been to a level of, of, of stress and anxiety and compact in one time period um, as I have been while in law school. But the feeling afterwards when the exams are done and you've passed, there is such a feeling of elation and accomplishment. Mm. It's like, whew, I did that. I wow. did that. And, and it's a struggle for so many people. And it was a struggle for everyone who made it with me. And it's a sense of accomplishment and fun and, 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 and support for one another. And you're rooting everyone on with you in class because you know how hard it is and you know you see them struggling through it with you. And after all of that, the idea that I have been in, in one career base for almost 20 years and there's, always times where I feel like I need to get out of here. I got to do something else. I need to do, but where am I going to go? What am I going to do? I would have to start all over again because I spent 20 years of my life in this sector area. Mm -hmm. And knowing that with a law degree, I could change my job every three years if I wanted to, doing something completely different wow. and have that base card and, and, and instruction and knowledge base that will allow me to change subject matters and to try something new and to help different people in different ways and not feel like I'm starting from square one zero and I have no idea what I'm doing or how I'm even gonna get there. Wow. And those options are really big. That idea of, of, of that option is, is priceless and worth, worth the money and the time and the stress. Wow, thank you. It sounds liberating. It sounds like it gives you uh, control of your future and it gives you the chance to feel like you're really in the driver's seat of your future. That's awesome. I, am, I have goosebumps from both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Tears in my eyes. I, I always wanted to go to law school myself and so I get a lot of vicarious joy out of helping other people find their way here. So um, I, I think we're um, two minutes to nine. We're about to wrap up here. And I'm, I'm glad to see Francisco Rosas, our um, Assistant Director of Admissions back on. And we have one more uh, request of any of you that are able to please complete a survey that uh, Francisco is gonna be emailing out to you at the close of this session. It really helps us to improve these uh, webinars and to uh, meet our assessments and, and figure out how we can better serve you. So please take another minute of your time to complete that survey for us. And thank you to our panelists so much from the bottom of my heart for your time tonight and touching the lives of others who might be considering a similar path. I feel like I know you more now, Vlad. I know you more. We're good. <laughs> We're like this now. Same. <laughs> we got so many classes together now we just did a whole other level. That's right, the whole other level. Thank y'all for being here tonight. Really appreciate your time, uh, spending time from law school and uh, doing this for us uh, and helping prospective students see your journey uh, is really inspiring to, to them. I, I, I'm pretty sure of that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, this helped out a lot. Uh, getting into the process of joining law school. I did two of these actually. And I think I see you, Francisco, and two of them too. 
and it, it helped me out. So even if you guys are still playing around with the idea, attend more, ask more questions. That's what I did. I had attended a couple of these and then I just pulled the trigger and I did it. So I'm, I hope these help you guys out and make your choice. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for being here. Please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me. My name is Diane Steele. My number is 326-1455. And Francisco? My name is Francisco Rosas, and my phone number is 326-1488. You can also find our, our names and our email addresses and phone numbers on our website at sjcl.edu under admissions. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.